الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد فقال جل وعلا ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام لا تقوم ساعة حتى يبعث دجالون كذابون قريب من ثلاثين كلهم يزعم أنه رسول الله أخرجه الإمام البخاري في كتاب المناقب Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Not very long ago I received a phone call from Brother Ahmed asking me to give a talk on Qadianism. I agree. That's why I'm here today. Having said that, he didn't tell me what aspect he wants me to talk on. And nor did I ask. And we left it at that. Till a few days ago when I started reading up on Qadianism. I found that one can tackle this title from three different angles. We can either look at the verses and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding the finality of prophethood, a hadith which proved that our beloved Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the last of all prophets and there is no prophet after him. Secondly, we can either look at the history history of Qadianism. How it began, the enemy behind it, its aims and objectives. Or finally, we can look at Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, the founder of Qadianism and the false prophet of Qadian. These were the three different options open to me. And I chose the latter. Because to look at the history of Qadianism would take a few hours. And demands a lot of concentration on your behalf. On a Sunday afternoon when the sun is shining, surely that would be asking for too much. Then we have the verses and the hadith of Rasulullah wasallam regarding the finality of prophethood. They are so much in number and so clear. That they need no explanation whatsoever. The hadith of Buhurira radiallahu ta'ala an akhrajahu al-imam al-Bukhari can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari. Ana khatimun nabiyyin. I am the last of the prophets. The hadith of Sayyidina Jabir radiallahu ta'ala an can be found here again in Sahih al-Bukhari. Fukhutima bihil anbiya. Exactly the same meaning. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam said, Kanat banu Israel tasusuhum al-anbiya. كلما هلك نبي خلفه نبي وإنه لا نبي بعد. That the people of Banu Israel were guided by prophets. Every time a prophet passed away, another succeeded him. Another one came. There is no prophet to come after me. وأنا الآقب والآقب الذي ليس بعده نبي. Yet again the hadith in Bukhari. That I am the last in the sense there is no prophet after me. Nabi Ali Salatu was salam said to Sayyidina Ali, Anta minni bi manzilati Harun min Musa illa annahu la nabiya ba'di. Yet again the hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. Nabi Ali Salatu was salam said to Sayyidina Ali, That you are related to me as Sayyidina Harun was related to Sayyidina Musa Ali salam, except there is no prophet after me. The hadith in Sahih Muslim, Fuddiltu al al anbiya bi sitti. That Allah has bestowed upon me six favors which Allah has not bestowed upon every any prophet before me. And one of these favors, 
Khutima bi an nabiyyun that I'm in the last in the line of the prophets. Yet again the hadith in Sahih Muslim, one of the most authentic books of the hadith, fa inni akhirul anbiya wa masjidi akhirul masajid. That I am the last of the prophets and my masjid is the last of the masaj. So these hadiths are so clear that they don't need me or any other scholar to explain them to you. Anybody who speaks a bit of Arabic can work out the meaning for themselves. That finally left me with Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, the founder of Qadianism and the false prophet of Qadian. And I have brought with me a lot of references and a lot of quotations. And the reason I have done this is so that you yourselves can listen to his words. And by listening to his words, you yourselves can judge him. Whether he was a prophet or whether I believe, as I believe, the clown of Qadiyan. Every prophet that has come has performed a miracle. By Allah's leave in support of his claim that he truly is a messenger. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiyani also believes the same. When Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam was thro- when Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam broke the idols, his people decided to punish him. What does the Quran say? فَحَرِّقُوهُ وَانْصَرُوا آلِهَتَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ فَاعِلِينَ They gathered wood. A huge bonfire was made. When it became hot, they threw Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam inside the fire. The Quran says, يَا نَارْ كُونِ بَرْضٌ وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ that Allah addressed the fire and said, O oh fire, become cold and peaceful upon Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now the speciality of fire is that it burns. What is fire? It is a thing that burns. In spite of this speciality, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam came out of the fire without a single mark on his body. This was a miracle of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. As for Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, or Prophet Jesus, as known to some that don't understand Sayyidina Isa, the Quran says, He would take clay, he would make a figure of a bird, and he would blow inside it. And this bird of clay, with the permission of Allah, would become alive, and it would fly in the air. The Quran says that he would cure the leper and restore the eyesight of those born blind, something that the doctors of the 20th century cannot do. He would bring the dead to life, all with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dead man or woman would come out of the grave, speak to those who knew and recognized them, they would die again and they would be buried. وَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا تَأْكُلُونَ وَمَا تَدَّخِرُونَ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ The Quran says that he would inform them of what they had eaten and what they had stored in their houses. Every individual he would tell them that this is what you have just eaten and this is what you have stored for tomorrow. These were miracles of Sayyidina Isa As for Sayyidina Saleh, when his people demanded to see a sign, a miracle, to prove that he is the messenger of Allah, he asked them what miracle would you like to see? They said, أَخْرِجْ لَنَا مِنْ هَذِي صَخْرَ نَاقَةً مُخْتَرِجَةً جَوْفَ That take out from this mountain a she-camel which is ten months pregnant and then this she-camel after it's come out of the mountain should give birth to a young one which is exactly which, say, which exactly has the same size is exactly the same in stature and body. Sayyidina Sa'ala alayhi salam prayed to Allah and before they knew it, from the very same mountain came out a she-camel, ten months pregnant, and then the she-camel in turn gave birth to a young one, which was exactly the same in stature, body and heart. This was the miracle of Sayyidina Sa'ala alayhi salam. Every prophet 
has performed a miracle by Allah's leave in support of his claim that he is the messenger of Allah. Our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was no exception. The Ahlul Seer, the historians write that our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed around 3,000 miracles. The hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, a group of disbelievers came to Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam and said, if you truly are the messenger of Allah, split the moon into two pieces. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam asked, will you believe in my prophethood if I'm able to do this? They agreed that we will believe. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His prayer was answered. He pointed towards the moon. And the moon was in one piece no more. Half the moon was on one side of the mountain. And the other half was on the other side of the mountain. And then Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam called these disbelievers by name. So that they be a witness to this event. And now they saw the splitting of the moon. They saw that half of the moon is on one side of the mountain. And the other half is on the other side of the mountain. But in spite of this they said, this is, ma- this is magic. Now Abu Jahl said that what we will do is ask those who live outside Mecca. Because if this is magic, then those living outside Mecca will not be affected by this. So every time somebody came from outside Mecca, somebody came from outside Arabia, they asked them whether they saw the splitting of the moon. And they would confirm that yes, we saw the splitting of the moon into two pieces. Now this miracle of Rasulullah was not just restricted to Arabia. People saw it from different parts of the globe. If you look inside the book Tariq Farishta, it is written that when the Raja of Maliba heard of this event from the Muslims, he caused an inquiry to be made by the scholars of his religion. To the age, Nabi Ali Salatu was was made a prophet. The Bremens conducted a research, and their research led them to the confirmation of the splitting of the moon and the Raja of Maliba embraced Islam. If you look at Suwani al Haramain, the book Suwani al Haramain, in, in this book it is mentioned that, in, that there was a city in the province of Malwa near the river Chamba. The Raja of this place was sitting on the roof of his palace and he witnessed the splitting of the moon into two pieces. And then he saw the moon go back together again into one piece. He asked the pundits regarding this incident and the pundits informed him that in their religious books it is written that a man will be born in Arabia and this miracle will take place on his hands. He sent a messenger to Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam and he embraced Islam. And Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam named this Raja as Abdullah, and his grave exists to this very day outside the city of Dahar, and people visit his grave. So this miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seen by all the people in the world from different parts of the globe. Another miracle, the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, narrated by Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, and he says, the Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam said, that the hour will not come so a great fire will which come out of Hijaz and it will shed light on the necks of the camels traveling from Syria, from in the land of Syria to Busra. This is what Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam predicted. Six hundred years after Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam died, in the latter part of the Abbasi rule, on the fourth of Jamad al Akhir. After Isha on a Jumu'ah of great fire came out of Medina to Al-Manawwara. This fire was like a huge city in which its tower and fort were appearing. The historians write that it was 12 miles long, 4 miles wide and around 1.5 man statues high. It flowed like a flood and it thundered like lightning. The right that had a strange characteristic that it would burn stone. The mountains dissolved and flowed like powder. But strangely, it had no effect on trees. And the people of Medina would work during the night just like they would work during the day. And the light of this fire could be seen from as far as Makkah al Makarama, which is over 400 kilometers away. So Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam predicted 
And this prediction came true after 600 years. Nabi Ali Salatu was salam left this world. So every prophet that has come has performed a miracle. Now, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani also knew this. That every prophet that has come has performed a miracle. Now, to justify his claim to prophethood, he also claimed to have performed miracles. Surpassing Nabi Ali Salatu was salam, he claimed to have performed 10,000 miracles. You can see this in his work, Brahini Ahmadiyya, volume 5, page 56. Let us look at some of his miracles or some of his predictions. Before we do so, listen to what he has written. He writes, you can find this, Marginal Note Arba'een, number 4, page 30, by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. He writes, If out of my hundred predictions, one turn out wrong, then I will admit that I am a liar. Ruhani Khazain, volume 19, page, two, two, page 288. To judge my truthfulness or lies, there is no better test than my prophecies. Aine Kamalati Islam, page 288. Let it be known to unbelieving persons that my truthfulness or falsehood will be judged by my prophecies. There is no other touchstone for it. Basically straightforward. That if one of my predictions goes wrong, then I am a liar. That I am not a prophet of Allah, I am lying. Never mind one prediction, today we will, have, we will look at two predictions. There was a Christian priest called Abdullah Atam. Now Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani debated and argued with this Christian Padri for 15 days on different aspects. 15 days they argued, argued and debated but the so-called prophet of Qadiyan was unable to defeat this Padri. Now he's unable to defeat this Padri after 15 days. He predicts and prophesizes that within 15 months of this day, this Christian Padri will fall into Hawiya. Hawiya is hell. Or he will return to the truth. Meaning that he will renounce Christianity and embrace Islam. That one or two things will definitely happen. Either he will die and his abode will be hell. Or either he will renounce Christianity and embrace Islam. Now when he made this prediction, Abdullah Atan was 70 years old. He was 70 years old. And it is more than likely that somebody will die within, at that age. For him to have died within the 15 months was more than likely. He was already 70 years of age. People die at this age. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended to expose his falsehood. This is what he wrote in this respect. He wrote this on the 5th of June 1893. So if we work out 15 months from the 5th of June 1893, we've got July... August, September, three months. The following September, another 12 months. That is 15 months. So the 5th of September, 1894, Abdullah Atam should have died or either he should have renounced Christianity and embraced Islam. This is what he wrote. You can find this in Jange Muqaddas, page 189. I admit right this time that if this prediction goes false, that is, if within 15 months from this date, the party who is on falsehood in view of Allah does not fall into Hawiyah as death punishment, then I am prepared to undergo every type of punishment. Disgrace me, blacken my face, color a rope around my neck or hang me on the gallows. I am ready for all. I swear by the greatness of Allah's glory that He will certainly do the same. 
will certainly do the same. Will certainly do the same. Earth and sky may, may deviate, but not his ordainment. If I am a liar, keep the gallows ready for me, and consider me the most accursed of all the accursed persons, evildoers, and satans. I repeat, if I am a liar, keep the gallows ready for me, and consider me the most accursed of all the accursed persons, evildoers, and satans. This was his prediction. Time passed. Days passed. Fifteen months passed. There is only a night left. What happens? The whole of Qadiyan come out of their houses. The young, the old, the weak, the male, the female, and the praying to Allah, Ke Ya Allah, Atam may die. Ya Allah, Atam may die. They're rubbing their noses on the ground and praying to Allah, Atam may die. And they're certain that Abdullah will not live to the next day and see the light of the next day because their prophet had prophesied that he's to die within 15 months and there is only a day left and he's definitely going to die next day. This is what the people of Qadian are doing. And the prophet of Qadian, what is he doing? He's casting spells, magic, for his death. He had charms recited over black drums and had them thrown into dry wells so that this Abdullah Atham dies. By the next day. Next day comes. And Abdullah Atam is still living. Nor does he renounce Christianity. Nor does he embrace Islam. And he's alive. Not only is he alive. He lives for another two years after this. He should have died by 5th of September 1894. He died... Another two years after this, July 1896. And this has been confirmed by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani himself in the book Anjami Atam. So he said, if one of my predictions goes wrong, then I am a liar. He further said, if I am a liar, keep the gallows ready for me and consider me the most accursed of all the accursed persons, evildoers and satans. So this is why I consider him the most accursed of all cursed persons, acting upon his own teachings. And this is why we consider him a, a liar, that he was not a prophet. Because he himself said that if I am a liar, then I am not a prophet. And this is why we believe he was not a prophet. This was one prophecy that went wrong. Let us look at another prophecy that went wrong. He claimed that his marriage, proposed marriage with a woman called Muhammad Begum, was a sign of his prophethood. Now, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani had a relative living in Punjab. He was called Mirza Ahmad Beg. And his daughter was called Muhammad Begum. He liked this woman. He was overtaken by her and he wished to marry her. He asked for her hand in marriage. And every time he asked for her hand in marriage, Mirza Ahmad Beg would refuse. Now what does he do? He wants to impress Mirza Ahmad Beg and to scare him. How does he go about doing this? He says that he received a revelation from Allah and he saw in this revelation his marriage with this woman Muhammad Begum. And Allah had assured him that he's definitely going to get married with this woman. Firstly. Secondly, if any of the relatives object, then the relatives and this woman Muhammad Begum will be caught up into in various different kinds of calamities will fall upon them. This is what he writes. He wrote this on July 10, 1888. He writes, That absolute omnipotent has told me, start negotiations for the elder daughter of that person. The elder daughter was Muhammad Begum, and that person was Mirza Ahmad Beg. In case of declination from Nikah, the end of that girl will be extremely bad 
And if she will be married to another person, he, within two and a half years from, and similarly father of that daughter within three years will die. Then in those days, attention was applied again and again for further clarification and details. It came to be known that God Almighty determined that he will bring the elder daughter of that person into nikah of this humble self after removal of each hindrance. Be clear to the evil minded that in order to judge our truthfulness or falsehood, there can be no greater touchstone of test than our predictions. You can find this in Majmu'i Ishtiharat, volume 1, page 157-159. Now he propagated this so forcefully through his letters, through his, through his books, through his leaflets, that if this person, Mirza Ahmad Beg, was a faint-hearted person, he would have given his daughter in marriage. And we look at all the works of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, we find that this drama went on for a few years. He begged him, he tried to persuade him, he tormented him. He threatened him, but at the end of the day, Mirza Ahmad Beg was the cousin of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. He didn't budge an inch. Never mind budge an inch, he gave his daughter to one called Sultan Muhammad. Look at his revelation foretelling, what he said. He said in this extract, If she will be married to another person, he within two and a half years, blah, 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 will die. Basically means that if the husband is going to die within two and a half years of the marriage, means that the woman will be widowed after two and a half years of her marriage. The woman will be widowed two and a half years after she gets married. Unfortunately for Mirza, she wasn't widowed two and a half years after her marriage. She lived for 57 years after this. Husband and wife, happily married. 41 years after Mirza's death. And 16 years in Mirza's lifetime. This is the first thing that's gone wrong with this revelational foretelling. The second thing is written here. If she will be married to another person, he within two and a half years from... And similarly, father of that daughter within three years will die. That the husband will die after two and a half years. And the father of this woman will die after three years. Basically means that the son-in-law to be, I mean the son-in-law will die six months before the father. If the husband's going to die two and a half years, and the father three years after the marriage, Basically means that this husband's going to die six months before the father. Yet again he failed. Because the husband did not die six months before the father. The husband lived for 57 years after the father. And the father died before the son-in-law. And the third place where he went wrong was he said... He will bring the elder daughter of that person into nikah of this humble self after removal of each hindrance. But Allah will make sure definitely Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani will marry this woman. He never married her. Basically means that Allah didn't help him one bit. So in one prophecy, he's made four mistakes. And according to what he'd said, Earlier, if out of my hundred predictions won't turn out wrong, then I will admit that I am a liar. To judge my truthfulness or lies, there is no better test than my prophecies. Let it be known to unbelieving persons that my truthfulness or falsehood will be judged by my prophecies. There is no other touchstone for it. We've seen two prophecies and both went wrong. We don't have time for more, but I assure you, you look at the relevant, relevant books, and you will find they're all like this. 
Now it is essential for every prophet of God that he respects the prophets before him. Not only does this himself, but he exhorts others to do the same. It is not fitting for a believer to dishonor any prophet. Never mind one who claims to be a prophet, he goes and insults a prophet of Allah. No prophet has ever insulted another prophet. Why? Because every prophet has come from God. Every prophet is a deputy of Allah. He has been sent by Allah with exactly the same message, La ilaha illallah. We will find that the only person that has insulted any prophet is this false prophet of Qadiyah. He's insulted Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, Prophet Jesus. Na'uzubillah, like none other. Now having said this, in his early days he believed in Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. He believed in Prophet Jesus. And he believed in the dissension and in the return of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. He believed this. Not only did he believe this, he supported this with evidences and arguments. Listen to what he's written. The prediction made in the Ahadith about the second coming of Messiah, son of Mary, is a prediction of the first order, which everyone has accepted unanimously. The manner in which the predictions are written in the Siha, no prediction is proven to be equal to it. It enjoys the highest status of Tawatur, the Gospel also endorses it. Izale Awham, volume 2, page 400. He further writes in Izale Awham, page 557, This is not a hidden matter that the prediction for Masih ibn Maryam coming again is a prediction of the first grade that has been acknowledged by everybody unanimously. Out of all the divinations recorded in books of traditions, this one is proved to be matchless. Among the Tawatur category, First place is occupied by it. In Jeel, Gospel also confirms this. Now, in his early days, not only did he believe in the coming of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, he also made it clear that he was not Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, and whoever called him Jesus was a liar. Listen to what he writes in this respect. Neither I am the promised Messiah nor Messiah ibn Maryam. Therefore, he who calls me promised Messiah lacks intellect. And one who calls me Masih ibn Maryam is a knave and a first class liar. So looking at his writings, early writings, he, cl- he believed in Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. He believed that he will descend for a second time. And he made it clear that he was not the promised Masih. And one who called him the promised Masih was a liar. This was his early career. Then something went wrong. <laughs> 